phone while commuting, playing games in your downtime, or even being a good and productive corporate drone, we all use apps and we use them a lot. I'm sitting down with Scott Fletcher from Redshield today to get a better lay of the modern app landscape. So nice softball to you, Scott. What is an app? Okay, so most people today have a smartphone and they think an app is Facebook, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, do kids use that these days still? Um, I think it's dying, but yes, I think it's still <laughs> in use. Uh, so most, yeah, most people think an app is the thing that's on their smartphone. What they don't realise is that it's mm -hmm. actually part of a, a larger ecosystem, you know, and we're not just talking about mobile apps, right? We're talking about uh, applications that are used by businesses every day. Probably the one that you might see the most often is like a point of sale system mm -hmm. uh, in a cafe or a retail shop. Uh, other things that everyone uses every day that is actually an app is like internet banking, uh, you know, right through to the APIs, which is the application programming interface. So the things that the mobile apps, the retail apps, the internet banking apps all rely on uh, is the underlying API. Uh, and these typically form a larger ecosystem that we call, uh, you know, in, in uh, IT applications. Uh, so as a society, we really do rely on apps and they're critical uh, to us individually, but also to businesses too. What are some of the dangers out there that can impact businesses in terms of a compromised app? I guess the, the biggest thing for, for, for the biggest issue for applications is that they're not maintained, uh, right? So a lot of businesses today are still running applications that are 20 plus years old. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, those are regional customers as well. Uh, whereby they've never been maintained, uh, mm -hmm. you find that uh, as a result, you know. So when you say maintained, what do you mean specifically when you say that point? So you're looking at, uh, you know, active. If you look at applications, you've got actively developed applications mm -hmm. or not actively developed applications. So things that typically we would class as legacy apps or newer, newer applications, mm -hmm. uh, the ones that aren't maintained, you know. So end of life years. applications. Yeah, that's There's right. actual no patches produced anymore yep. for these types of applications, but they're still existing within organisations and that no one actually even knows that they have end of life type of applications that are in their organisation and no one does anything with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those could be running on Server 2000, right. you know, believe, <laughs> believe it or not, they yep. still exist. Yep. Uh, so yeah, obviously poor design, uh, poor, poor hygiene, poor development standards, uh, poor security operations leads them to be vulnerable uh, to a range of different attacks. You're looking at uh, motivated or opportunistic attacks, um, you know, we're looking at targeted data breaches, those types of things, right through to, you know, DDoS in mm -hmm. some cases. Do you think companies actually know how many applications they've even got across their organisation? Uh, no. Right. <laughs> That's a big challenge uh, mm -hmm. and the industry has actually changed and, and tackled that in a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, if we think back in the day, it was actually really easy to do application Should discovery. You have like five. <laughs> what was it? Sorry. You had like five apps, so it was obvious. Well, you had five. Uh, they were typically all running on the same website uh, or in the same domain, which was your main domain. Mm -hmm. uh, and also we had zone transfer, which was now, you know, it's a class of security vulnerability in its own. Mm -hmm. uh, and where, you know, you could just simply say, hey, give me all the DNS records for this domain and it would dump them out. So what type of advice would you provide or you could give to people that potentially are looking to know exactly, okay, where are all my applications? Uh, how are they being patched? So do you have some advice on how people can manage all of that? Because you sort of said before, you've got legacy applications and you've got newer stuff coming uh, into the organisation as well. How should security teams go about managing all of that? Yes, there are some uh, products and solutions out there. I guess the easiest way, the cheapest way is look at all your DNS records, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you obviously you have domains, uh, you have DNS records within those domains. Uh, simply just look at your DNS records. Uh, Although that's not a, it's not a foolproof, 100% um, accurate way because you, are, you can run applications on subfolders and all sorts of different ways as well. Uh, but an understanding what your internet perimeter looks like is certainly the first step in that. Um, Google <laughs> is also, <laughs> so, believe it or not, there are, there are ways uh, to use Google to ch uh, list out your applications as well. Some companies don't even know all of the domains that they actually uh, uh, hosting or they even uh, are utilizing true yes yeah uh, we quite often get us we quite often get have customers that come to us and say look uh, we're not even sure what our perimeter looks like or they'll mm -hmm. say oh look we just want red shield for these four applications and you go well what about these other 20 and what about this one that's managed by your third party uh, and the big the most interesting thing there is that a lot of the time you'll find uh, 
the the services that, it's a, that you would rely on. So DNS, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, your name servers and those types of things, which are typically managed by a third party, are uh, actually the ones that, that have vulnerabilities on them too. So when companies are coming to you and saying, hey, Scott, we have no clue in our perimeter, what sort of your response or Red Shield's response to a request like that? So look, we have a range of tools. Uh, we're very lucky. Uh, we have um, access to Bit Discovery, um, which is mm -hmm. a product by Jeremiah Grossman. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which actually allows us to look up DNS records uh, for domains, which is actually really useful. There are other products and solutions out there like Asset Note as well uh, mm -hmm. that can do similar things um, because it takes the notion that DNS records are essentially in the public domain. So it's taken a, rec a, a collection of those mm -hmm. uh, and then allows you to, to basically search them in a database. So we've all heard the common security measures for securing these types of environments like X, Y, Z. What do you see as a fundamental tool or tools to help protect us now, both individually and for organisations? Okay, we'll tackle we'll tackle the individual one first because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a little bit of an easier easier one. Mm -hmm. uh, look, first thing is pragmatism has to, has to be the first thing you have to look at, right? So, no, the understanding and the notion that not everyone gets everything right 100% of the time. Sure. And I'm talking about us individually. I'm talking about the businesses we rely on. We're talking about Google, Facebook, everybody, including the government. Uh, have had notable breaches uh, over many years, right? So uh, you have to look after your, your own personal data. You have to take some level of responsibility for that first. Um, I would certainly say the first thing would be password reuse, right? So mm -hmm. don't reuse the same password, right? I know everyone freaks out when you say use a different password for everything. They go, how am I going to remember that? Uh, Which and is a fair statement, right? It is. Uh, <laughs> if you've ever been... Uh, on on site, you know, and I'm sure you know we t we have um, security awareness training to say that don't do this. But a lot of people write their passwords down. They put them in a book, or they write them on the bottom of their keyboard. It's probably more common that someone's going to have a Word document or an Excel document that's, that's, on, that's on their desktop that other people have access to. It's on a network share, uh, and you see that in shared you drive. Shared drive. Yep. You see that in businesses. Uh, you've got a list of servers, server names. You've got the username, which is typically root, uh, and then the password, which is typically the same for every server, but in a spreadsheet that everyone can access. Uh, one of the other key things that you can look at is two-factor authentication, right? So, in the in the very unlikely event or very rare case that someone was able to actually get one of these strong gen strongly generated passwords from a password manager, and they attempt to log into a system, uh, you can essentially use two FA, uh, which is something. The whole principle behind that is something that you have and something that you know. So there's something that you know is the password and something you have is your, your phone uh, to actually log, on, log in and ident positively identify yourself with that application. Okay, so let's now talk about the business side of things. So mm -hmm. we've spoken about what individuals can do. What are some of the things that businesses can adopt in terms of reducing that risk? Yeah, look, I, I would say you need to employ multiple strategies. It's the same thing. Uh, as us personally, we, we need to understand that not just one security control is going to be sufficient or not just doing one thing is actually going to solve the problem, right? So uh, the idea behind it, uh, most businesses employ vulnerability um, strategies like uh, SANS, vulnerability mm -hmm. management, uh, but unfortunately a lot of those things are just left down to manage, detect and report. That's not actually, well, what do we do about the vulnerability? It's, hey, we know we have a vulnerability, um, but we're not actually sure what to do about it. And the, the real reality is you need to find and fix vulnerabilities quickly. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, doing nothing is just not an option anymore. You know, if we're looking at vulnerabilities and we're looking at the landscape out there today, we find that uh, most, you know, if, if there's a CVE, uh, you see active exploits of those, those issues occurring within, you know, four days, mm -hmm. you know, in the case of Equifax, right through to, you know, two weeks, which is the, the typical uh, statistic these days, right? So uh, if you can't fix it yourself, you look at other options, right? Um, and unfortunately, you know, so if you if you try and do it yourself, you go to your developers and you say, okay, guys, we've got all these issues, what are we going to do about them? Um, most of the time, uh, they'll say, look, we don't have time, resources, money to fix these. Uh, we're actually even not sure how to fix them or fix them reliably. Mm -hmm. So you start looking at other options, right? Uh, and one of those options might be a web application firewall, right? So you've got uh, a web application firewall, which typically at best might only block half of the issues that you have uh, facing the internet in your applications, um, but that still leaves you 100% vulnerable, right? Because you actually have to find and fix all the vulnerabilities across all your applications to be 100% uh, secure, or as close to 100% secure as possible, right? So that kind of leaves you with the other option. It's like, well, what other options are there? Uh, and in the case of Red Shield, uh, we use virtual patching or shielding mm -hmm. uh, to achieve that 
as close to 100% vulnerability mitigation as possible. Look, you and I do talk about this a lot, and it's it's probably one of the frustrations that I think that I hear from you guys, and and um, in terms of where people get confused between a WAF and shields. So let's define that very clearly, so people know that you guys just aren't a, a WAF company, and some of the challenges that sit with trying to delineate between what these two what these two items actually mean. So can you talk me through that specifically? Okay. So WAF is typically a security appliance mm -hmm. uh, or a product that's designed with a set of signatures or rules to mm -hmm. detect uh, traffic or detect something, if we use the term very loosely, detect something and then take an action. Mm -hmm. uh, that typically boils down to uh, a yes or a no. Uh, so it's very black and mm -hmm. white, you would say? 100%. We've Correct. We've tried, to, well, the industry has tried to address a number of the issues around false positives and Correct. application compatibility through the use of machine learning. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find, unfortunately though, that that still boils down, it's just a fancier algorithm mm. to... But there's so many variables still. Correct, and there's essentially an infinite uh, number of vulnerabilities, right? If you think about software, there's mm -hmm. an infinite number of software combinations mm -hmm. to achieve the same outcome. Sure. Right? The idea here is that you've essentially got an infinite problem space with an infinite number of security vulnerabilities. Uh, it's the idea or the notion that we could catch them all. Mm -hmm. um, the idea behind a WAF, right, is that if you, uh, all you if all you can say is a yes or a no, all you have the option is to uh, allow a request or block a request, if we're talking about WAFs and applications. Right? The, the difference there is that uh, not all vulnerabilities can be, you know, just detected of or blocked, right? So and they're getting more sophisticated now, so it's hard. It's harder <coughs> to just go accept or block. Well, that's right. So some vulnerabilities you just you just can't. Like there mm -hmm. are session management vulnerabilities, uh, authentication, authorization, business logic vulnerabilities, which you simply can't just block. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, and the industry typically has instead of going, oh, how else can we address the, the solution, which mm -hmm. Rachel does with shielding, uh, they've typically gone to the approach of saying, well, let's try and identify the bad actors uh, and block them instead, mm -hmm. which once again is not a foolproof solution. So you're sort of talking about like threat hunting and stuff like that? No, I'm talking about more analysing the, the behaviour of the traffic. So okay. looking at, okay, this person appears to be doing something that they shouldn't in the site. We're not mm -hmm. really sure what they're doing, uh, but they could, they could potentially be doing something bad, so we'll block them. Right? Gotcha. Rather than saying, okay, we know what the vulnerability is uh, and we've shielded it uh, using virtual patching. But don't you think that would take a lot of effort from a company to be constantly doing that? And detecting if someone's doing bad behaviour and then blocking it, like, doesn't that require a lot of upfront sort of uh, initial work from a company and then to manage that moving forward because the landscape changes by the minute? Well, it depends who you speak to, right? Mm -hmm. if, uh, if you're a customer that's tried to employ this, uh, this type of technology solution, you're going to find that it is a lot more complicated than the vendors will tell you, gotcha. certainly, during, certainly during the sales process. Uh, a lot of the time they'll say, hey, yeah, great, very low false positive rate. You're going to think, well, that sounds awesome. It just means we can turn it on and it's going to do what it should uh, and I'm not going to have to manage it or monitor it. The reality is far from, uh, the f it's far from reality. You typically find when someone tries to deploy this technology that uh, it actually consumes a lot of time. Uh, mm. And it's, in most cases, maybe not all cases, uh, you'll find that they have to actually turn a lot of this stuff off. Uh, or they have to hire a team of people to manage it. So let's so that, okay. So then let's focus now on the shielding side of it because I wanted to get granular with the WAF stuff because I still do feel, like you said, shielding is something that's it's a new type of concept that people aren't very familiar with. So can you explain at a high level what this means and what type of outcomes you are getting for organisations? So for a lot of our customers, when they originally come to us, they come to us with a set of problems. Typically, they're under attack. They have issues. Uh, they're not sure how to manage it themselves. I guess the, f the first thing that we are very successful at uh, is onboarding customers in a really quick, quick space of time uh, to resolve their issue. Right? Mm -hmm. And when I talk about resolving their issue, usually uh, if they're not coming to us under crisis conditions, which is we need it, we need it yesterday, how quickly can we have it? Uh, it's we've failed a pen test and we've got all these issues which we can't fix ourselves. So we can't, our developers don't have time, the third party vendor doesn't have the source code, they're not willing to, we can't pay for it, it's too expensive. Uh, that the actual end result is that all of those vulnerabilities are resolved using Red Shield. Mm -hmm. right, so we've got customers in the US uh, who have risen to the number one 
uh, number one industry mm -hmm. uh, for healthcare on risk recon, uh, which is uh, you know, unheard of. You know, we hear healthcare is one of the worst industries uh, for security vulnerabilities and patching uh, and application maintenance and uh, security operations. Uh, so to be number one for healthcare in the US is, is a great is a great outcome for them. Um, but you know, looking more domestically within Australia, certainly uh, customers that have zero unresolved vulnerabilities facing the internet is the ultimate goal with mm -hmm. Red Shield. So both of these are obviously useful tools. We all know companies like Cloudflare, Imperva and the like, and they've got a good reputation in the market. So where does Shielding come into it and what are the use cases for both of these solutions? So I would say Cloudflare and Perva are what we call commodity WAF solutions, right? They're an out of the box, uh, they're a DIY tool, right? So you have to operate it, you have to understand how they work, you have to implement it, you have to manage it, monitor it, uh, you have to configure it, you have to be on the call when something goes wrong. Uh, so that's essentially what we would consider um, uh, all of the solutions out there. A lot of them have managed a setup. Um, they call it, a, they loosely call it a managed service, but it is managed setup essentially. Um, but it's not ongoing, manage, ongoing management and operations of, of the solution. Uh, whereas Shielding, right, so we, Red Shield is a completely managed solution, so we do it for you. Right? Mm -hmm. So we operate all the tools that you need to essentially, like I say, have zero unresolved vulnerabilities facing the internet. And so when you spoke before that there was a, uh, when you're setting up in the beginning, they have that as a service, but there's no ongoing services. Why do you think there's no ongoing services? Because again, this is something that does need to be monitored, looked at, changed, uh, and, and I guess like people need to know about it. So wh why do you think there are services out there or these traditional services don't actually employ that? I think it's a mixture of things. Uh, I, I think a lot of the industry has moved towards, well, heavily towards automation, as, as we see, right? So everything from day to day, you know, your, your Google Home, right through to how, you de how your development teams build applications these days, right through to today and even in security operations. The idea that being able to do things faster and quicker and better requires less human interaction, mm. I think is where a lot of people make the mistake. And certainly when it comes to security, I think in application security specifically, mm. you'll find that, uh, you know, we, ha we have the analogy, if it can be found by a machine, it can be fixed by a machine. Whereas if it's found by a human, so like a pen test or as part of a pen test, it's not going to be something that can be easily fixed reliably using a machine. So using, mm. using a typical WAF solution. So uh, this is why we deliver it as a service, because it actually requires a set of key unique skills um, from a range of individuals mm -hmm. uh, running in 24 by 7 operation uh, to actually deliver that outcome. Got it, okay. And I guess that makes sense because, like you said, that people still don't quite understand the difference between a WAF and the Shields. And it's something, I mean, I sort of see Shields as obviously helping in terms of compliance too, uh, when it comes to protecting data under, say, PCI, HIPAA, GDPR, or meeting the data protection standards in Australia. Uh, do you reckon that's a fair assumption to say that what Red Shield's offering it, uh, helps with that level of compliance too that's required? Yeah, look, most businesses have to have a vulnerability management plan, but vulnerability management in uh, most businesses, I would say almost all, uh, and even some that I've worked at, uh, is just detection only, right? Detection and reporting, right? So, hey, we know we've got a vulnerability, uh, we're not really sure how to deal with it, right? And so that, that alone, it, it prohibits you actually achieving your, your compliance goals, right? A lot of industries say, look, you've got to patch vulnerabilities and within a certain period of time, uh, but most of them, as we know, just never get fixed. Mm -hmm. So when you say that you're talking about there's detection and then there's reporting, so when companies, so obviously they've detected that there's a, there's a vuln, but then why isn't anyone doing anything about it? Is because a lack of, I have no idea what I'm doing, never seen this before, or just pure, we're just inundated, we don't know where to start? Sometimes, look, it is just a, a matter of where do I start? Sometimes it is we don't have the resources available. Most of the time it's, <laughs> well, in, in some of the more extreme cases, like I mentioned before, we don't have the source code to change these, uh, to change these systems, or it is so mission critical. So it's on a third party. Yeah, well, it's on a third party, or yeah. maybe it's an application which we manage, which we don't have the source code anymore. You know, mm -hmm. these apps, like I mentioned, 20 years, built 20 Oops, years ago. Uh, we even look after one that's a, a Delphi application, pre-compiled Delphi application that was written in 2000. So I hear horror stories, sometimes genuinely amusing if they weren't so serious. 
uh, all the time of marketing overreach. Uh, there are snake oil salespeople out there, so I'm guessing you've been hit up before about this being more of the same. Yeah, uh, it's true. Um, I've walked into some, <laughs> some meetings with customers and the first thing they see is this is way too good to be true. Uh, and on the flip side, we've had some customers that have come to us uh, at the end of a deployment, you know, and we're talking emergency deployment, uh, where we've patched vulnerabilities which they, their exact terms to us or exact wording to us was, we were bewildered that you could actually virtually patch that. Uh, this was a company that had spent, uh, it was a UK based company and they had spent, uh, they actually decided to turn the platform off, right, until they came up with a solution. Uh, they'd, ha they'd had a pen test, they had a serious race condition uh, issue and uh, without saying too much, mm -hmm. uh, they decided that it was best to take the platform offline uh, given GDPR concerns. Mm -hmm. And uh, after three, sorry, they give themselves three months to evaluate uh, what they were going to do, fix it, patch it, however they were going to get it back online. They were two months, one week into that process, at which, which point they reached out to, rip to us at Red Shield. And uh, I think it took us about two or three days to patch, mm -hmm. and then they spent the next three weeks as a customer getting three independent pen testing companies to go and confirm that we had virtually patched the problem correctly, uh, at which point they turned the platform back on. Uh, so it's an, mm -hmm. it's an interesting use case, right? But to have the customer come back and go, we had no other option, uh, but we were actually bewildered because we didn't think, our developers just had no idea how to fix this. If people uh, are wanting to reach out to you, how can they go about doing that? Probably via our website's best, because uh, we have uh, representatives in, in the United States, Australia, the United Kingdom, uh, and New Zealand as well. Uh, more also reaching out into uh, to Singapore now these days. Uh, so via our website, which is www.redshield.co, mm -hmm. uh, or alternatively, you can reach out to any of us on LinkedIn. We shared a Scott Fletcher on LinkedIn. Yes, correct. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Bye. you for uh, turning up. <laughs>